Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Dojo Live. Today is Tuesday, April 12, 2022. This is Tulio Sergusa broadcasting from Southern California. Joining me today is Kim Lantis in Hermosillo. Oh, and... Hi. Wow. Did I tell you or did I not tell you that we're going to be interrupted? Oh, and without fail, right at the introduction, here, here's Zoe. <laughs> We'll try to minimize them as best we can. That's why they invented the mute button. <laughs> anyway, we have Gyura Engel, who's the co-founder and CEO at Neosec, who's uh, joining us from Palo Alto. Welcome, Gyura. Good to have you. Thank you. And Good we're going to gonna talk about uh, an interesting conversation today about APIs and security uh, and risks. Uh, but before we go into that topic... Let's get to know our guest a little bit. Uh, so, Gira, if you could uh, please introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about you, and then we'll uh, dig in and see what Neosex is all about. But let's get to know you a little bit. And again, welcome to the show. Th thanks for having me. So may maybe a little bit of uh, introduction about, uh, about myself. I, uh, I started uh, um, you know, more in the cyber warfare field. Uh, you know, kind, kind of coming from Israel, maybe it's uh, maybe it's obvious these days. I don't know. It feels like everybody comes from, from the same background in security. Um, and uh, it, it, Neosec is my uh, my second time starting a cybersecurity company. Um, I, I did the whole journey uh, before with Light Cyber. Light Cyber was uh, the company that invented the concept of XDR, what's known today as XDR, and then became part of Palo Alto Networks. And uh, and now uh, you know. A couple of years ago, started a, a new company called Neosec uh, in the API security space. That's kind of my, my background in a nutshell. Very nice. Uh, Gira, tell us about Neosec. What was like that aha moment that made you and your co-founder decide, we need to go do this? And what is it that you guys do today? So I've been in enterprise security for for a while, almost for uh, you know, almost for maybe nine years before uh, uh, before Neosec. And I realized that while enterprise security is important, these days everything that is being built, uh, getting built today is, uh, is application environments and APIs because of the way that we do business today. I mean, everything is virtual, everything is externally facing. So people don't really build data centers anymore and don't have internal networks to protect. Instead, they, they build applications and expose APIs. And it, it looks like all of our, all the controls that we built for, uh, you know, for, for the enterprise network are, are not relevant for these new environments. So that was kind of my uh, um, my understanding that you know something needs to be built for you know for this uh, new realm. Uh, there, there's actually one one uh, specific meeting that I had with a uh, with a customer uh, back in the day. It was actually quite some time ago, about five years ago. It was a, a very modern company, and you know, I realized that they don't have a data center, they don't have any like any real infrastructure internally, but they deliver that service that millions of users use. So I mean that. That, that kind of told me that you know the future is probably something different than what we're that, what we were doing back then, um, and, and that 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 was maybe the first seed that I uh, was in my mind. All right, so we have the modern enterprise that has been somewhat left behind by solutions that were not built for the modern enterprise. So let's see what we can learn today, and uh, what is the risk? What are the risks, and how we can manage them? Uh, Kim, if you could introduce the topic and uh, see what the question is that we're going to answer. I'm looking forward to seeing what we can learn. Sure. Thank you for joining us today, Giora, Leo, as always. The topic is chosen by our guest is APIs in the future of cybersecurity. I think you already learned that why this is the future very nicely in your introduction of SEC. But the question we're trying to answer is, are your APIs putting your business at risk. Now, when I popped into your website, I did notice this that struck me as quite creative and also made me curious. And that was something that you refer to as an API blind spot. Now, I know blind spots when I'm driving my car, right? Or you're taught if you need to change lanes, you can't just trust the mirror. You got to look over your shoulder. <laughs> what is an API blind spot exactly? So it, it, it's interesting because, you know, when we develop new uh, services, new products, new, uh, new applications, we, we have to expose a lot of data to the outside. And uh, that, that happens today by design. It's no longer a case where we, we build some internal, uh, you know, very gated system and place it in a, in a data center and only a, a few people can access it. Instead, we're actually designing these applications to be exposed to the outside. 
Now, we take care of a lot of different security aspects of, of these applications, like cloud security and, and other, uh, other security controls. But the actual API or application that is exposed to the outside is just exposed. And nobody's actually looking how it's used. You know, what, what, what happens, uh, you know, if the, uh, the client that is using it is, is compromised uh, or, you know, if it's not using it correctly. Uh, that, that, you know, th these are, this is typically where, you know, the new types of, uh, you know, of cyber breaches happen today. So that, that's kind of the blind spot. It's maybe an obvious blind spot, but it's actually a blind spot that almost every organization has today. All right. And that's exactly where NeoSec comes in then? Yes. Yeah, so, so I, you know, the, the first problem that we, we typically help solve um, is, uh, uh, you know, is API, what's called today API discovery. Um, it turns out that a lot of organizations expose their applications and APIs. I mean, it, it can be part of their web application uh, or part of, of you know, as kind of a service-to-service -service communication that, that um, um, fuels the, the product or, or delivers uh, part of their uh, uh, product ecosystem. Um, and the, the first step is really discovering all of your APIs, getting an inventory of everything that you're uh, exposing to the outside. Uh, then, of course, we you know we do also detection and response and, and help with, you know, with other steps of, of the journey. So, Gura, if you could just maybe let's unpack this a little bit from where we've come from, where we are now. So uh, you mentioned the many of the security, cybersecurity um, or security products that were created were predominantly created, created for the enterprise, like on-prem type of application. So let's call it a closed garden. Uh, you also had software that had a lot more feature functionality within that closed garden that didn't need to interface with other platforms. Today, it's different, right? We have a lot of interdependent applications that, so it's more of an ecosystem that are that are necessary for many enterprises to run their business. So it's not just a one-stop software solution. You've got to be able to interface with a number of different providers. So it's an open garden. Um, so what's the difference in terms of how you handle security in the closed garden versus the open garden? I mean, the, uh, the answer might be obvious, but I'm curious to get it from your perspective. Yeah, no, it's, I, I think if you're, uh, you know, hundred uh, percent accurate in, in your description. I, I think it's, it might be obvious, but it's uh, it's a struggle that a lot of companies are, are going through today because the change is really in the business needs. It starts with the fact that um, you know, your business needs require you to expose your core business, the most sensitive data, to the outside. It's almost like an, an oxymoron. I mean, it's, it's completely different than the way that it, it used to be done before, but it's really a business need. So there is no question about it. It has to be delivered that way. And, uh, and, and therefore, the, the security paradigms need to shift a lot because it's no longer just protecting the infrastructure against intruders or against, you know, um, uh, you know, access that is not granted, but it's really it's really that granted access that is the riskiest, because you, you're you know you're opening your, uh, for example, if you're a financial institution, you're letting all of your you know it could be millions of customers access their you know bank account, uh, perform money movement transactions, um, and and you integrate with also some B2B partners that enable fintech applications to access that that information. So all that the most sensitive information and the ability to move money is exposed to the outside. So it's no longer um, enough to just protect the infrastructure. You need to understand what is going on on your platform and make sure that uh, you know, even those authorized uh, operations are, are really uh, accounted for and you know, done right. Because you know, otherwise, of course, you can, uh, you can lose PII, you can lose money. You can, you know, uh, I think the, the loss is very, very uh, tangible um, in that sense. So if we could just paint that a little, explode that a little bit more. Um, let's just use an example. Think of a, a company that has an automated cash flow solution with their bank. And what I mean by that is one of the biggest problems for companies is managing uh, cash flow as it relates to demand for inventory, to make maintain the inventory, deliver inventory to their buyers. So there's some solutions out there that might automate this. In other words, I have the sales system that shows how many orders I have. And then I have my inventory and I can identify the gaps. And through some AI solution, I can go to the bank and say, I'm going to need extra amount of credit line to fulfill these orders. And I've got the money coming in from it because it's all connected. How many APIs are, are we talking about there? I mean, the, there's a possibility for three or four different supply chain solutions cobbled together with APIs. And where are the risk factors there and how do you manage them? 
Uh, so, so maybe I'll start with the the, the known uh, the, the the better known quantity, uh, which is the the APIs that fuel the web application itself. So typically, in, in such a platform, there is some kind of user access that enables the user to, you know, to to see their account and perform some operations, uh, and that uh, uh, that web access is is typically implemented through APIs today, meaning that there is some kind of uh, uh, you know client side uh, application that is uh, uh, implemented as a web application. Or even a mobile application, and the back end is implemented through APIs. So these APIs can really expose all the data and perform the transactions and operations. So this is maybe the the um, uh, another way to think about it is the evolution of what used to be monolithic web applications into more modern microservice-based applications. But this is only one of one of the uh, uh, the areas where, where APIs are used. Uh, the biggest, uh, the, uh, maybe fastest growing uh, pool of APIs is actually these B2B APIs that enable service to service communication and integrating between different components in order to deliver a bigger service. So for example, in, in, in such a platform, uh, if you have a, a way of another vendor integrating with that platform and adding more functionality, uh, that is typically uh, implemented through uh, B2B APIs. Um, another you know, good example for B2B APIs that we see every day, uh, when we access our bank account, uh, you know, with, with our uh, uh, you know banking application, uh, th that typically involves web or, or mobile-based APIs. But when we access it through another application that maybe manages multiple accounts, or when we link between accounts, uh, you know, we have you know different different bank accounts and different uh, institutions. Uh, the way that we link between accounts that's that's enabled through B2B APIs uh, that you know in the background can you know get the information and and bring it from one place to the other on your behalf. Um, so that so these B2B APIs are really the fastest growing, and, and I think um, to date it's, it's really obvious that in you know within the next few years we're, we're going to have 10x more types of uh, you know of integrations and APIs compared to what we see uh, today because every new feature and every new product capability uh, develops more and more of these uh, APIs. I, so where's the risk? Go, go ahead, Kim. I'll wait. Sure. Well, I was just wondering, this This makes me think about, you know, the future of the cybersecurity API is where it's headed. My question is about maybe the regulation or who who does the onus belong to? Whose responsibility is this? Is it mm -hmm. me with my product? Is it the, you know, the owners of all of the APIs and the other tools that I'm utilizing? And is it everyone? And at what point would we see or are we seeing any type of regulation come in? Because it sounds sort of like everybody's, forgive my analogy, but it is what it is. You know, COVID, you know, let's wear masks. And like, if everybody were to wear their mask, maybe this is going to work. But inevitably, you've got people who just aren't into it. They can't, they don't know, they, whatever. So is this, as you're talking about this tremendous numbers, is this going to get more regulated? What do you expect in that sense? So maybe maybe start with um, uh, you know who, who should care about it and and then uh, um, maybe I'll, I'll uh, switch to uh, you know some regulation that exists actually in, in the space. Um, so I I think you know the, the APIs are, are um, uh, unidirectional in a sense. I mean they, they can transfer data in both directions, but it's very clear who's the provider of an API and who's the client of the API. Uh, there is uh, there is some kind of asymmetry in, in the model. Uh, so the provider of the API, uh, which typically is a, uh, you know, a company that developed that particular service and you know, exposed that particular service as part of, of the offering, um, is the one that really cares, you know, should care and, and should protect their APIs because it typically it's linked to their core business uh, versus you know, the client that you know, it can be related to a business process, but um, you know, the, the, the client that has much less to lose than uh, the provider of, of the API. Um, so, so typically, I mean, if, if you're, if you're for example, in our, in our um, um, example of, of a financial institution, the financial institution really should care and, and should protect their APIs. Uh, now, as for regulation, we, we actually we've seen some new regulation, um, you know, coming up. I mean, there is on one hand there is more regulation that requires companies to expose APIs, uh, you know, in order to have more competition and more, uh, you know, better service to the customer. For example, in in, uh, in healthcare, we see uh, you know patient access regulations and interoperability. Uh, that basically requires, you know, the, the healthcare uh, insurance companies uh, to expose all, all these, you know, sensitive information uh, details through APIs, so that you know we can move from one provider to the other, and, and so on and so forth. So that there's 
uh, and there's another uh, set of regulations with open banking that uh, requires uh, some financial institutions to open uh, more and more access. But um, so this is kind of a positive regulation that, uh, that encourages companies to, uh, to use APIs more. Uh, but there's also some regulation of, about uh, protecting your APIs. Uh, for example, the, uh, uh, you know, the FFIC, um, you know, which, which is you know, part of the Federal Reserve, uh, they have some regulation for uh, uh, certain types of uh, financial institutions to uh, treat APIs like, you know, like an inventory of, of things that they need to, uh, to protect. Um, we, we see some new regulations also from FTC. Um, so, so there, there it's definitely became like the new area of, uh, you know, that you need to, to protect. And you can think about it like the, the next layer. I mean, if, if you protected the infrastructure, that, that's great. But now you need to protect the application level, which is one level up. Yeah. And this is why it's important for politicians to understand technology. <laughs> Perfect. Well, it's, it's look. You know, we often talk about this. The beautiful thing about technology is that it democratizes access. It gives people access to things that were used to be either a closed garden or only for a set few. It, it's an equalizer. It makes it possible for everybody to get access to, to services and products and things that that uh, it, it's an equalizer, right? So the risk factors, as you mentioned, is all these things work with these interconnections, you know, these APIs. So if one, one company isn't protecting their themselves very well, it puts everybody else at risk. So now the entire ecosystem's at risk. Um, so what's, so how do you solve that? I mean, is, you know, is, does it, for your solution to be effective at Neosec, do all the participant of the ecosystem have to implement the solution or is it just good enough if one does? Does it extend to all the other APIs? How does that come together? Yeah. So, uh, so I think just like I mentioned before, um, the, um, it, the keys are really in the hands of the provider of the API, you know, the company that uh, authored the APIs and, uh, and you know, exposes their sensitive data. Uh, you, you don't need the others to, to participate in, in anything specifically. And I think, by definition, all these other parties, you, you don't control them. You, may, you might have some agreements with them. You, you provided them some access, but you don't really control their implementation. That's the whole purpose of APIs. You know, you're, you're opening your APIs so that different implementations can access your, uh, your data. Um, right. And the way it works is by uh, performing behavioral analytics. So um, I, I mentioned in the beginning that my background was inventing uh, XDR, the concept of network and endpoint behavioral analytics uh, you know, that is widely used today. Um, but uh, I think in APIs, the same concept is needed. You need to be able to, uh, to see what is going on and learn about normal user behavior. Um, and by learning the normal behavior, you can spot different types of abnormalities that, um, you know, that, that should be, uh, uh, you know, flagged and, you know, maybe investigated or maybe even blocked. Uh, and, uh, and that's kind of the key because in the end of the day, it's not enough to just look for known patterns. Um, you know, the, the industry has uh, a lot of different tools and technologies to look for, you know, different types of known patterns. Some of them are, are uh, known as OASP top 10. Um, but beyond that, uh, you need to be able to, uh, to understand the behavior of authorized users and, you know, traffic that looks legitimate, like technically it's, it's authorized and it looks okay. Uh, it might be um, actually abuse of, of your APIs because in the end of the day, your APIs you know, expose all that sensitive information and enable you to perform, you know, different types of transactions. Uh, so, so you need to be able to, uh, to monitor that behavior as well. So I can't help but ask this question, and that is, are APIs not effective? Is there another next generation solution that we ought to be thinking about? It's a, it's a good question. I, I, I don't think that there is not anything inherently good or bad about APIs. I mean, it's uh, the way that I think about APIs is like thinking about it as the new network. What do I mean by that? Because, you know, network, we, we're used to, you know, packets and routers and switches. Mm -hmm. You know, today we don't really care about these uh, devices anymore because most of them are virtual actually. I mean, there, there are some physical devices but we consume them through the cloud. So, I mean, for us, it's, you know, it's all kind of virtual assets. Uh, so we don't really care about that layer anymore. It's, it's kind of taken care of. Uh, as a developer, I mean, you, you know, when you use, you know, serverless and you use different types of uh, cloud environments, you don't really need to actually build, you know, the physical infrastructure anymore. Uh, 
but the APIs are uh, another layer on top of it that enables you uh, interconnectivity between different services, both internally within your own application uh, and also uh, exter externally to, uh, to your partners and, and end users. So I, I think you know, we need to think about APIs like the new network. Mm. Now, on top of that new network, you can implement whatever you want. Um, and, and of course, you also need to, uh, to monitor it and secure it. That's interesting. I mean, to, I, 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 would, I think it's fair to say that they've mostly functioned like the new middleware, right? I mean, that's kind of what APIs have functioned as, the new middleware. But I like your concept of the new network, which is uh, a different approach to it. Um, so how, does, how do we evolve there in terms of enhancing cybersecurity, tightening this up? I mean, I get NeoSec has a solution, but ultimately every advancements in technology eventually has a cycle, right? Mm -hmm. Are we at the end cycle of APIs and looking at the next way of looking at it, i.e. the network, or are we still in the middle? Where, what are your thoughts? And I'm kind of asking to look at it a crystal ball a little bit, but yeah. you being in the space, I'm curious to learn where it's heading. So I, I, think, I think we're in, actually in the beginning of it, even though, I mean, I, I remember, I think when I started my career, it was around, you know, 99, um, I remember, you know, like web, web-based APIs were the new thing. And it's this, really the same thing as now. It's just that, you know, th there were some different variants. I mean, we, we you know, we used to see in, in, in the past, we used to see things like SOAP and XML APIs. And, uh, you know, now, now we see more RESTful APIs and, and, you know, kind of different variants. But, you know, the differences are so small that it doesn't even matter. Um, so it's, it's not a new invention, uh, but the way that it's widely used today to deliver business applications is new. And I think it's, it's, again, it's related to the business transformation, the digital transformation that all these companies are going through and their need to expose all that, you know, uh, you know di digital uh, uh, products to, to the outside. So I, I think it's just the beginning of, you know, in terms of what companies are going to expose and how they're going to do that. Uh, we just crossed um, the point where most of the attacks that we see today are, are related to APIs that are exposed. And I'm sure that we'll see more and more because you know data centers are, are not, you know new data centers are not built and and you know the the future is in all these applications. Um, and I think that the pace of development is really amazing because at every company that you look at, if, even if it's a financial institution or or a, a very modern tech company, uh, they, they all develop more and more of these applications and APIs in a faster and faster pace. Uh, so so I think what we're going to see in the next years is that. Um, you know, a, a very, very big growth of these B2B APIs. And with that, the need to, uh, you know, to, to think about protecting the business as a core part of building these APIs. Yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense what you're saying. Like, it's not necessarily this brand new technology, but it makes me think of, I think I saw this meme once. It was talking about how it used to be that the very rich were the owners of cars and the poor people were the owners of horses. And today it's the opposite. Everyone owns a car and only the rich people own horses. And so it's like that shift of what had to change in order for cars to now be all over the road and you don't see watering holes and I don't know, whatever the posts are to tie up your horse and whatever. Um, so is that, that's sort of what's happening here. It's like, it's technical, it's been around for a while, but now it's this mass adoption. And now it's like, we need to create parking lots and, and whatever else and figure out how we're going to handle this. Yeah, I think the the use cases uh, uh, changed while the technology was was already there, you know, for a long time. So all of a sudden, you know, we, we just need to expose a lot of things to uh, um, you know to users and partners that need to be able to use it. Um, so it cannot be obscure anymore. I mean, we used in the past we, when we exposed some some things to the outside, it used to be some obscure protocols, some proprietary, you know, things that only you know we we, we know about, and you know maybe the other side needs a, a very specific reference or SDK to to use. Um, but with APIs, we, we can do it in a much simpler way. Uh, you know, you document it in a standard way, like you know, Open API or also known as uh, Swagger, and um, it enables the other side to just you know use your platform regardless of how they're implemented and so on. Um, so that that simplicity is is you know something that is a, a business need, and you know this is why. This is why it's stronger than any other IT trend because it really comes from uh, from the business side, and when you have a business need, you have to deliver, um, and, and that, that's you know that's why I think we see the the fast adoption, um, and mm -hmm. I, I think the more participants, you know, in, in that ecosystem, the more uh, like for for example, I, I can represent the uh, 
you know, the fintech uh, uh, ecosystem. I'm, uh, you know, as part of, of my uh, participation in, in this uh, area, I'm, I also lead the, the fraud prevention task force at the FDX, uh, financial data exchange. So we, we see that, you know, once financial institutions open the option uh, to, uh, you know, for aggregators and fintechs to uh, connect to their platforms, we see thousands of fintech applications that provide all sorts of services that, that people need. Um, so there is, you know, there's all, all of a sudden, uh, you know, a way to get uh, more data from, you know, from your bank account information and more, uh, um, more products and more capabilities. Perfect. Talking about the business and the use cases, we're having minutes of our show today. I believe in your introduction, you mentioned that Neosec is your second uh, adventure as a co founder. And let's just talk a little bit about, about the company. What is it that makes maybe Neosec a little different than maybe your previous company or like what's, are there shifts in culture or learnings from company A to, to Neosec? What has shifted? So, so uh, by, by the way, I didn't mention that, but, but Neosec is actually my third. Uh, the, the first one was, uh, was not as big as, uh, as LightCyber. Uh, but, but, you know, that's, that's part of, uh, you know, real life of a founder, uh, you know, sometimes you, uh, you know, s- sometimes you succeed and everybody knows about your company and sometimes, you know, it, it doesn't grow the, the way you wanted it. Sometimes you put um, it in the closet and forget about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sometimes you fail and everybody knows about your company too. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, we, Nielsen, uh, you know, is, uh, I, I think kind of, you know, doing it twice, like, you know, the second time in cybersecurity, I learned so much in, in the process. Uh, both about you know building the company and building the team, and also about you know uh, you know go to market and you know uh, uh, finding the you know the right customer profile and how to to find the right product market fit and so on. I think from a from a company perspective, I think what what I'm really um, you know most proud of is is, is our team and the way that um, uh, that we empower uh, you know the team and the, the way that they can actually take that empowerment and and do things that I I never thought uh, you know would would be possible. Uh, I think in, in the end of the day, I think what's unique about Neosec is that we um, we were uh, born with the pandemic. I mean, we started the company just a couple of weeks before the lockdown. Um, and, uh, we, you know, nobody knew that it's going to happen, right? And all of a sudden, uh, we, ho- we all had to shelter in place. And, uh, and you know, we, we just started to, to hire people. Um, so it was very obvious for us that, you know, people won't always be able to, to be together you know, in the same office. Uh, we have a, a large R&D team in Israel, uh, but, uh, you know, to, today they, they can use the office more, more regularly, but, uh, you know, in the, in the beginning, uh, you know, every, every case, every, every lockdown, um, you know, uh, made it harder. Uh, so, so I think it really focused us on creating good processes and good communication, but also I, I think the most important thing is the sense of ownership. People need to, mm-hmm. to know and to really own you know what what they're uh, what they're building it doesn't matter if you're a, a junior developer or or you know the most senior uh, you know vp of engineering um i think your ownership needs to be very clear you need to to understand the mission very in a, in a clear way and uh once that is done right uh people can actually do above and beyond what you think they they could do mm-hmm. um so this is really what what excites me the most i mean as, as a ceo and, and founder of the company beyond the you know the technology and, and, and all the the cool things, I, I think it's really empowering people and seeing that people can, you know, can do things, uh, you know, can go above and beyond, uh, can, uh, um, you know, can get to the next level, even from their own career perspective. Uh, that, that, that I think is the most uh, exciting in the end of the day. Congratulations. That's great to hear. That's great to hear. And that is actually the definition of a leader instead of a boss. So we appreciate that you're doing that. And I'm sure the people working there appreciate that as well. We need more more of uh, those types of CEOs who care about people's personal growth and success, not just the metrics. Uh, that's how you get engagement and people to stay committed and loyal. Is you actually- and and I, I think, I mean, I think it's also the, the way that you get, you know, it, the, the high quality work in the end of the day. I mean, I think that, you know, it's, uh, it's important for people's growth and all of that, but it's also, I think, really important for the company. Yeah. Um, there's, you know, there's a direct correlation. It, um, there's actually studies that show that we're 
uh, highly engaged employees that are empowered, that have a sense of co-leadership and shared authority, those companies are in most cases 7x more profitable than the S&P 500. So it's not just good for people, it's good business ideas and good business sense. So we're glad to hear you guys are doing that. We're up on time. Unfortunately, I, we have a bunch of other questions. I would be curious to learn more about your experience as a, as a co-founder, as an entrepreneur, everything you've learned through this journey. But maybe if you can squeeze that in in a quick 30-second clip, what is it have you learned about yourself as an entrepreneur? Oh, so, so many different things. I mean, it's... Uh... <laughs> I, I think that you know ma managing people is probably the most uh, you know the most important thing, um, and and I think um, you know having a, a clear vision and, and communication is is really important, and uh, doing it right from the beginning is also important because whatever whatever you start with is what what you're you know you're going to have that forever in, in a sense even if you try to change it, uh, whatever DNA you start with you know in, in the company it's uh, you know it's, it's only going to grow. Um, and I think it, it's really important to do it right and to bring the right people um, and, you know, to promote the right people and so on. Uh, so that, that, that I think is, is probably the most important. The other thing that is completely unrelated, um, maybe more technological, is that uh, I, I think, you know, through, our, our, uh, through my previous journey and this journey, um, we, uh, you know, I came to realize the, the difference between, you know, building SaaS and, you know, between, and between offering SaaS as an option. I think that's a big one. Uh, that's maybe a topic for a, for a whole you know different discussion. But uh, yeah. SaaS is really a whole culture. It's not like just a feature. It's not like a delivery method. Uh, you know, building a SaaS company is like a whole uh, a whole world, and uh, it also means a lot for our customers. Sounds like something we might be able to discuss in our design thinking show. Anyway, thanks for being with us, Giora. We appreciate you. Thanks for being with us again. Uh, just stay with us as we go off there in just a second. Can we got one more show tomorrow, right? Who do we got? Yeah, here's Zoe making her presence. You'll probably hear her howl in just a second. But yes, we have one more show this week, and that will be Thursday afternoon with Elizabeth Bernstein, CEO of Nura Health. So don't miss it. I will be taking the show off that day so you don't have to deal with my children. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for being with us again. See you back on Thursday at 12 p.m. See you then. Bye.